How's everybody? Hi. Uh, I think the most important thing on this slide is my Twitter username there, at Jay Baggy. No, I heard that. I can grab some water. Here. <laughs> now I'm going to be talking about uh, responsive web design. Um, so, these all terms I think you guys have probably seen before. I don't know if I'm in the way yet. Like, just rather sit. No, it's kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do. Um, so these are all, all, all terms you've probably seen before: masthead, fold, letting, um, you know, letter space, line height, all those type of things. And um, where did these? Oh, cool. Um, where, where did actually all of these sort of web terms um, come from? Um, and they actually came from, this is dude. See, hug, hug it out there. Good. Cool. Um, and all of these, these terms that, that, that we use every day in CSS and on the web um, all come from print. Um, we've, all, we've literally just taken them off the shelf, dusted them off, and applied them to, to digital. Um, and our debt actually goes uh, to print actually goes a lot more than just the language. Um, I think one of the most important concepts that we've adapted or taken from uh, print um, is the canvas. Um, so whenever you start um, in all like, sort of creative mediums like you know painters, um, sculptors, carpenters, for example, they always start out with a canvas, whether it's a block of actual physical block block of canvas, a piece of paper. Um, a piece of wood or whatever, they have the exact width and height of the dimensions they're going to be using to create you know, their final product. Um, and the thing is with us as web designers, um, we're actually one step removed from our final canvas. So we start off with, you know, you open up Photoshop, Fireworks for example, um, and you know, create new new page, new canvas, and you set width and dimension, you set dimensions to it. But the thing is, it actually, as you put more content to your site, it grows. Um, um, you decide, okay, well, let's, we're going to stick with a 960 wide um, grid, for example. And when it eventually gets onto the web, you're at the mercy of all of different browsers because um, that's where your final product is going to be viewed. So we've got all these different browsers, and I'm not even going on to the different devices, um, that the person at the end is going to be viewing your work. So we are one step removed from our canvas that we're busy um, designing for. Um, the other thing is there's a whole bunch of inconsistencies and um, imper imperfections with browsers these days. And we all know about IE as a perfect example. Um, but they all you know, do things differently. And that's something we have to, you know, we create this amazing design in Photoshop. And then so the designer sits in, he's like so stoked. And by the time he sees the end product on the web, it's like, it, it doesn't always, if, unless you know what you're doing, and you've got some top-notch de developers, it doesn't always look the same. The design, and I have this sometimes with Adrian, like we have this, create these amazing designs, and he comes out at the end, and he's like, that's not like exactly how I did it, and we have to fix all those things on every single one of the browsers. The other thing is, so to get around this, what do we do? We create these fixed width um, layouts, so that we can sort of control the user experience you know, at the end of the day. We stick out with, we also use fixed uh, sized fonts, for example, so that when a user um, views the site, and we say, uh, normally we always use start of a couple of years ago, and we use 960 as a, as a good starting point, and we're still using it today. Now people are pushing, oh yeah, let's start at 1140 as a great you know, grid size that we can now, because people are using bigger screens and all of that. Not really. I mean, now you can see people with iPads, for example. So things are getting smaller and bigger at the same time. Um, the other thing that obviously happens is when you're designing a fixed width grid, grid um, there's a, sometimes what happens is a horizontal sort of bar appears if the browser, if the browser is a bit is smaller than what you've designed for, um, and then some of your content actually just gets clipped off. Like a, it could be your search, uh, your search button. It could be, for example, your half a telephone number. So it's not, it's not great. Um, and then a guy called John Alsop, uh, about a good 10 years ago, uh, wrote this quote and said, we should embrace the fact that the web doesn't have the same constraints as print and design for this flexibility. But first, we must accept the ebb and flow of things. 
So the thing is, we're at the moment um, in this transition period where devices are getting bigger and they're getting smaller at the same time. Um, and Ethan Marcotte wrote, the long and short of it is we're designing for more devices, input types, and more resolutions um, than ever before. And I think the crux of this whole thing is the web has moved beyond the de desktop and it's not turning back. Now, the whole, what, what he's trying to say is at the moment, we're fragmenting our content across all these different device optimized um, experiences um, and it's actually a losing proposition to create so you start off with a website and you've got an iPad friendly uh, site and you've got a mobile site and you've got 500 different mobile site uh, different mobile phones that you're using and you have to create all these device op optimized sites um, and we can't actually keep up with the pace of the of technology I mean no one can so I mean what is what is the actual alternative um, to this and that's where we come into responsive architecture. Now, architects um, had started designing um, different ways to adapt to the amount of people, for example, in a room. So I've seen these really cool sort of glass um, windows that they go opaque and um, see-through depending on the amount of people in the room. So an example like here, because there's a lot of people, those, okay, those back windows are not too great at the moment, but that, They'd go completely clear, and there'd be a whole clear section on the side, and it would give us this more, this bigger feel. Same with with the, there's also these panels. Um, I think it's these Germans that have, have designed these panels. They're also, same thing. These panels move and shape depending on the amount of people in the room. So architects are coming up with really smart ways of adapting the the environment that they have to whoever's sort of in the room. Um, and we're obviously. Um, and obviously, as us web guys, we're all building all these disconnected designs. So a website, a mobile site, and all these different optimized sites. And we actually need to just you know, let go of that and realize that instead of creating all these disconnected designs um, for one particular browser, rather treat your site as, um, as a, oh, a rather treat it as the same facets or the same, uh, same, same oh, sorry, man to treat them as facets of the same experience. So have, if you're going to create a, uh, uh, a full-on website, give the person that's on, your, on a mobile phone or on an iPad the same experience that you're giving them on, your full, on your full, the full um, site that, you, that you're obviously busy building. Um, so, not, so in other words, craft sites are not only um, more flexible, but adapt to the, obviously the media that's that busy building, that, um, that, readers, that renders them. So now, Responsive web design, there's three main sort of sections to creating a responsive web design. You need a flexible grid based layout that includes uh, fonts as well, um, flexible images and media, and then the right at the end there, media queries. Now I'm going to go through each one of these um, and explain to you how we're actually going to build one. So to start off with a flexible grid, so I think the most important thing um, whenever I've started with any action side doesn't even have to be responsive, is using some form of a reset style sheet. So here an example, I think Eric Meyer's CSS reset, for those of you that, you, that do design, I think you should know about this already and should be using some form of reset if it's not his. And using some form of reset, at least it starts you off on a nice even platform across browsers, resets all the font sizes, all the quirky things that some browsers do. Um, that's always a good, good starting point. And that sets you up also for further down when you're creating your flexible grid. Also, using percentages instead of pixels um, for your widths, margins, and paddings. Okay? That's obviously quite important. For your font, same thing, using EMs instead of pixels. Um, and then also when, I'm going to show you now, there's a little bit of maths involved to sort of you know, convert your pixels to percentages and EMs. Um, and you're going to come up with some decimal points. And I mean, it can literally go six or seven decimal points. There's no need to round them off either. Browsers, browsers funny enough, are they're pretty smart. Some of the definitely new, new ones. And they'll handle, that, handle those decimals um, pretty well. So rather just leave all your decimal places um, in, in there. So here's a, a very, very basic example and the formula that you use uh, for percentages and EMs. So it's a target that you're trying to... Um, that you're obviously trying to design for, the context of that is in, and that'll give you the result. So we start off with a very simple H1. You're trying to get it to 24 pixels. That's the design your designer did in Photoshop. He wants it to be 24 pixels. Um, and to convert that to EMs, what you're going to do is your target is 24 pixels. 
Now, 16 pixels is the default browser um, font size. Um, most browsers use it, and if you're using a CSS reset, it also then makes sure that's sort of your default browser, I mean, default text size. So all font sizes start off at 16, and you're either going to go up or down based on um, uh, the size that for, for EM. So at that, 24 divided by 16 gives you 1.5. Pretty simple. Same with font si uh, the, the paragraph. You've now wanted to make it smaller um, at 12 pixels, and 12 divided by 16 gives you 0.75. So if we have a very simple, minimal blog design, I don't think any of you have ever seen a blog like this. It's amazing. Um, starting off with a nice 960 wide grid, um, well, width, with a 660 pixel blog content in the sidebar and a bit of a header and there's some padding on the sides there. So if we're now trying to design uh, a, a responsive sort of site for this, you st I mean, if you weren't, this is now what you'd start off. So your body, 960, centering it, you have that container, which is now 920 pixels with 20 pixels on either side. Um, you've got the blog content um, floating left and your sidebar floating right. I don't really test like this, but I mean, you get, the, get the, the, the point of it. And now to go and now create this and make it responsive. So if, you go, if I just go back again, so we start off with the width. So the only real, I think, guessing part when it comes to... Um, Responsive design here is the only well, only guess that we start off is a width of 90%. Um, it's sort of you got to you can start off obviously with 100%, which then stretches your full browser width, um, and then you're going to have to add padding in, you, or you can just do this where there is a nice five. You're sort of giving a 5% margin on either side when it's when it's centered. So that obviously that's where you start off with. Um, then your container. So now if we quickly go back to the design. That's okay, 920. So we've got 920 there, 920 divided by 960. So the context is 960 because that's what your container is in the body. Um, 920 divided by 960, you percentages times by 100 gives you 95.8. Obviously, don't round these numbers off. Um, gives you a much more accurate design. Same for the blog content. Now your um, context is 920 pixels. So if you go back to the design, which is here. From here to here, it's 920, and your your blog content is within that um, con in that uh, container. So that's why you're using 920. 660 divided by 920 gives you that, and the same for the sidebar. 260 divided by 920 times 100, and that's pretty much um, how you start off creating a flexible grid. You can move on to margins and padding. Um, so say we had a little bit of padding around the header and we had a logo that we pushed in 10 pixels. Once again, 20 divided by 9. So we did stick here we, the top and the bottom margins. We left it 15 pixels. Um, that's something you can tweak later on as you uh, design for the different um, devices because um, obviously that's just top and bottom. Whereas left and right, when you're scaling it in and out, that's just something that needs to be able to be flexible. So once again, 20 divided by 920 is once again your, your context, gives you two point whatever, and the same for the logo if you're just pushing margin left. Um, so it works across all your margin, and it always works well for negative margins as well. So if you need to push items out, outside, of your, outside of the uh, margins, et cetera, to you know, create some really neat, unique designs, it works, just slap a, a negative sign on, and it works just as well. Moving on to flexible images and media. So now, this is pretty much it. <laughs> you literally give your image a max width of 100%. And what that does is um, it gives whatever the, the, um, the container that your image is in, what this is telling it is do not, ever, do not stretch uh, wider than what the container that you've given it. So it then just fills up that space, and as you're shrinking it, that space is obviously uh, contracting, and your image is also gonna, going to scale down. Um, it also scales proportionately, and the aspect ratio of images also then adjusts. So your images are, and obviously what you have to do is when you specify your images, don't put widths and heights to those images. Um, just leave them as, as um, the images in there, and that will then scale it. Another thing that works quite well is, if you don't want to use that, is overflow hidden. So that actually works quite well, but that obviously with overflow hidden, it actually removes, it, it crops your image pretty much. So it's just depending on what situation, what you're trying to do with your images, 
um, if you need to use max width or overflow hidden. Now, the thing is, modern browsers work really well with that. Um, IE6, not so much. From i7, understands max width. So for i6, you can just use uh, width at 100%. Um, that that uh, works pretty well. And also, this also works um, now with more, we're using now more HTML5 um, with embed object and videos. So that then also then scales those up, up and down pretty well. There are some other caveats to that um, with all the videos and stuff and these JavaScript plugins that can help and all of those type of things. So, but I mean, at the, right now, I mean, that, that works pretty well. Problem is with um, older browsers, um, Windows doesn't really like us in terms of scaling images. So uh, IE7 and, and below, Firefox 2 and below, um, when you scale the images, it loses, the, qual the quality of the image actually becomes worse, especially if you've got text in your images. So in order to sort of get around that, Windows 7 seems to be fine. Um, so that, that seems to work pretty well. Um, and to fix sort of th those issues, um, if for those of you that have had to you know, fix PNG issues in uh, IE6, is that Alpha, what's called Alpha Image Loader Microsoft class that you can, um, and that works pretty well to fix all of those sort of, sort of uh, issues. Um, so now, obviously our designs, once we've now adapted the, the um, we've, got our, we've got our flexible grid, we've got our images that scale, our fonts now also now off um, flex, but the problem is um, no design, whether it's fixed or fluid, um, scales beyond the context which is originally designed for. So how do we actually make our designs um, more flexible or more responsive? Now, this is where media queries come in. Now, some of you might remember this from you know, way back. We used to design screen and print uh, style sheets. Um, and media queries have been around for years. So it's in the CSS2 specification, and you know, this, this works 100%. The problem came in when, right in the beginning, we had this really cool handheld media. So for, for, web, for mobile phones, um, but like 10, 15 years ago, the only phones we all were rolling with were like Nokia 3310s and, and like, you know, those type of phones. So I mean, like, there was no real web to design for. Um, and as more and more browsers, uh, as mobile browsers became more and more, um, you know, the technology increased and now we had you know, full color screens and we're now you know, sitting with iPhones and Blackberries. When they were the, the mobile browsers were like, okay, cool, how are we gonna now show mobile, mobile sites? They looked around, there were like zero handheld uh, style sheets on the web because we'd all been designing for screen and print. Um, so it's actually our fault that you know, this has come about. So what they did was they just served up the screen uh, print uh, the screen media style and you know went with it and sort of adapted to to the phone um, and with now these media queries to make your make a responsive design which is really really cool is how you then target the different sizes okay so this is in your CSS uh, you just specify at media and you there's a whole bunch of keywords which I'm going to show you that you can then use to target the different sizes so here the first one is targeting Anything within those brackets, so you can see a body size, the, the, the body tag, is for any uh, site or any browser window that is bigger than 124 pixels. And that's what you're then, any CSS that you put in there is going to then display just for widescreen browsers or browsers bigger than 124 pixels. You can either import it into your head of your HTML or you can obviously use the import tag within um, your CSS, um, calling an external style sheet. I prefer the first one because it keeps all your CSS in one file. Um, so there's not always external queries to different files and all of that. But I mean, they all work uh, really, really well. Now, these are all the, the, the features that we can test for, which is pretty cool. And that, some of them also have min and max um, features that we can use. So there's width, height, for example, that you can go min width, min height. Some of the really cool ones are like orientation, so landscape portrait, iPads, iPhones, Androids. Um, you know, you can look at colors, um, depending on the amount of colors on the screen. I'm, I don't know anyone that ever, would ever use that, but I mean, you never know. Scan um, is for TVs. I mean, you've got those new Samsung smart TVs, so that's also in there for that grid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you can also daisy chain them together, so you can go min width and orientation, um, or device width and, um, you know, color, for example. 
um, which, so then that helps even target it even, even further. The one more important thing that we need to uh, do to our site is add this viewport tag to our, our header in our HTML. Now, a phone like an iPhone 4 um, has, when, it's, when you open up the browser, it shows all sites at 980 pixels wide, but the device is only actually 320 pixels. It actually only has a width of 320 pixels. So it's actually just shrinking it. So what that initial scale 1.0 is doing is it's actually saying, take whatever site you're giving it or whatever site it's loading and show it at 100%. So here's an example of the New York Times. If you go to this on your phone, is that it shows up the entire site within that window and you can't read a single thing and you have to pinch to, to um, make it bigger. Obviously, they've got to have a mobile site, but I mean, this is their full site. So that initial scale would now take the 980 pixels that it's busy showing it drag it out to 320 pixels. And that's what you need to do for your, um, when you're designing for mobile using, obviously, responsive design. Um, there's obviously some compatibility things to, to bear in mind with media queries. Um, all modern browsers support it, um, as well as mobile browsers too. And there's like Firefox mobiles coming out. Um, but also they're on the bandwagon. Opera Mini, for example, they all know about it. And either, I'm not sure if it's already in, but some of them already have uh, beaters out that work very, very well with uh, media queries. I8, yeah, not so much. Um, and below, it's typical. Um, so to get around those issues, there's two sort of JS files that you, you can include that will then you know, um, allow IE8 and below um, and some mobile browsers to then accept uh, the responsive design. Um, we can also then go on and on about, um, there's also other methods of doing it without using JavaScript. I mean, we can quote stats of who uses JavaScript, who has it enabled, disabled, all of that. Um, but I mean, for most cases, it, it's going to work really well, but there are ways of doing it without using JavaScript. Um, so just also bear that in mind. Um, when you're also obviously now designing, there's a, these are a couple of example sort of, you know, pixel widths that you can sort of target using that min width and max width. Um, iPhones and Android devices are like about 320 by 480. 10-inch um, tablets, all the rage at the moment. Um, you know, those are the two depending on landscape or portrait and then widescreen displays. And I think a lot of us in our offices, we're sitting with like 27-inch uh, monitors, 24-inch monitors, and sites are actually got these massive like, you know, uh, margins on the side. And now with this, is you can actually then why is the footer need to be at the foot in the uh, right at the bottom? You've got such a wide screen. There are sites that are using this technique really well. Is if it's a really wide screen, push the sidebar, change the design, and put it in the right, the right, uh, on the right side of the, of the site. So that works um, pretty well. Um, the crux of the matter is is obviously some reasons for using it and obviously not using um, responsive design. The thing is, why I'm really um, sort of really enjoy using responsive um, web design, so I want to use it more and more, is that you're giving the user the same web experience across whether they're on a widescreen 27-inch screen or right down to their, their mobile phone. Um, so you're not actually taking away anything from, and also the thing is with the user's context, we sit and go, okay, the guy's on a mobile phone, that means he must have he must be, have no data, He's like everything must be, like we must serve no images to the guy, um, but in actual fact, some of us sit at home on a couch with a four meg wireless running at a house, and we want to, and we're just using our iPhones to browse and read articles and look at pictures and stuff like that. So that's the context of which that using is assumed. We assume that the person's on the train and like you know only has like a ten meg data bundle, but in essence, it could be either way. So using responsive design, you're giving a guy experience that he would have on his big widescreen right down to his, his mobile phone. Um, the other thing is, what you can do is with this is actually start thinking the other way around. So start from, think, start from designing the mobile experience first and, and focus on, because when we design mobile sites, we're actually, we're actually removing all the fluff, removing all the social media links, removing all these extra um, things that we don't ever show a guy on a wide, or we don't ever show them on a mobile site, but we show them on, a, on a, the full site. Start thinking with that. So you're actually focusing on the most important thing, which is either the content and, you know, could, to a certain extent, could be images. Focus on that on the mobile site and build it up so that um, in that way, you're serving, for example, small images when they're on the mobile phone 
And then when they're on a bigger device, you're going, okay, cool, now load in the larger images. And I think that's the counter argument to it is that, for example, you're lo loading these big images and all these extra code that when using responsive design and shrink it down, is that you were hiding sort of elements and we're removing images and all of that. And that, that is still loading in the background. Um, and it's still loading on the guy's phone. He's just not seeing it. So this data is still being transferred there. So I think that's a, one of the arguments against it. But I think if you start on the mobile side and you grow, grow it up, that sort of counters that. Um, it also makes you think a little bit more when you're using responsive design to not just, yes, the designer just sits there 960 wide, pumps out a design, sends it along, and, and starts again. We're actually now starting to think about what are, what are my users, like what is the browsers and, and, and devices they're actually using to use my site um, and, and look at my site with. And that also makes you think a little bit more about your visitors um, and what you should be doing in different devices. So I think that's also something that you, when you're designing a responsive website is that it actually makes you think, what is my site going to look like on a 10-inch tablet? What is it going to look like on a BlackBerry? What is it going to look like on a, on a um, you know, cinema display? Um, so those are the things that, you know, that, that help. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, obviously, the things, the images, that, that's obviously an issue when scaling an image down. But it depends, once again, on what you're trying to do. So an architect, for example, um, and there's an example that um, we'll show you now, is that as an architect, as an architect firm, they've got some amazing images of the places they've built and designed and all of that. Now, you serve them, they now have want a mobile site. Now, you serve up a mobile site that has no images in because you just want the telephone number and the guy's address. Now, no offense, I want to actually see, when, even if I'm on my mobile phone, I need to see what this company is actually doing. So, with a responsive design, it's a perfect um, example for them. It's to start off, they've got these amazing images on this widescreen max, and as it scales down, the images are still there. It's just showing in a different format, and you know, his mobile site is perfectly tailored to what he's trying to achieve. It's not for everybody. Um, there are definitely cases where you should be building a mobile-specific site serving it to you know, phones like a Samsung E250, et cetera. Um, but that's something that you need to sort of you know, think about. Depends on, completely depends on what you're designing for. We've got some, if you, this, this site uh, we, we built, it's just a little one-page site. These are all the resources. There's a whole bunch of resources on, on responsive web design. If you check it out, this page is also responsive, so you can check that out. There's some basic code in the back end of that. Um, and there's some really neat examples. And I think the one of the coolest ones that I found recently that just redesigned was the Boston Globe. So bostonglobe.com. It's uh, owned by the New York Times. It's a massive news site, and they've just built a responsive design. And um, when you show a user, an end user, like, hey, check this site out, and look what happens when you go down and you shrink the, just shrink the browser, they're like, they actually can't believe it. It like it freaks them out. So it's because it actually just looks so amazing. So if if sites like that are starting to realize, hey, we can build responsive designs, um, I think the future is pretty pretty bro uh, rosy for this. You check that out, um, and that's pretty much it. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>